please welcome Eileen Sullivan Marks, Academy President, and Susan Hassmiller, Senior Advisor for Nursing at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Senior Scholar in Residence and Advisor to the President on Nursing at the National Academy of Medicine. Hello, I am Eileen Sullivan Marks, President of the American Academy of Nursing, and welcome to the Institute for Nursing Leadership's Critical Conversation on Health Equity and Racism. The Institute, or INL, is an Academy's signature initiative and speaks to our strategic goal to position nurses to lead change to improve health and healthcare and drive policy. INL's focus on supporting the role and leadership of nurses has helped to promote fellows to key decision-making tables. Typically, INL hosts a workshop and luncheon that brings thought leaders together to strategize and generate solutions for complex challenges. This year, INL has partnered with the Academy's Diversity and Inclusivity Committee with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to discuss critical issues impacting health, namely the racist underpinnings and structures present within our systems that cause inequities. We are proud to work with the Foundation as their dedication to a culture of health is in line with this critical conversation. This allows us to provide this conversation to our fellows, colleagues, and stakeholders. I want to thank Dr. Susan Hassmiller, Senior Advisor for Nursing at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for her commitment and support of this important dialogue. I would also like to take a moment to recognize the INL Planning Committee, led by Bobby Berkowitz, Chair, and Hussein Tahan, Co-Chair, as well as Julie Fairman, Chair, and Ginny Chin Hansen, Co-Chair of the INL's National Advisory Council, and Kenya Beard, Chair of the Academy's Diversity and Inclusivity Committee. The DNI Committee helped to create the vision, champion, and helped to plan the virtual event. As you know, we have seen a remarkable outpouring of advocacy and action related to the Black Lives Matter movement this year, which has elevated the conversation and placed important emphasis on the topic of racism. The Academy has made multiple statements on this issue, staunchly supporting the need for social justice to address prevalent racism, discrimination, and violence against communities of color and black and brown people. But we know we must do more. As leaders, we must leverage the power of the fellowship and our profession to take concrete, actionable steps and frankly, eliminate racism. It is my promise that this event will be the first step of many that the Academy takes. And so today we will begin with this critical conversation with Drs. Barbara Hatcher, Sheldon Fields, and Monica McLemore. Their expert insights will outline the myriad of ways in which racism truly is a public health crisis, as evidenced from the increased rates of COVID-19 infections among Black and Latinx populations, and the higher rates of police violence, which are among other distressing factors. But these forward thinkers will also show us how we can build a better future through our collective impact. You will be prompted to select and join one of two in-depth dialogues. After the dialogues, attendees will have the opportunity to join reflection rooms where conversations will be facilitated by members of the INL and diversity and inclusivity committees. This will be an opportunity to share personal experiences, stories, and ideas. Thank you for being here with us today, and I look forward to the afternoon's discussion. I would now like to welcome Dr. Sue Hassmiller from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Welcome everyone. My name is Sue Hassmiller. I am the Senior Advisor for Nursing at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm so glad you're here joining in this discussion today. I wanna to thank the American Academy of Nursing for hosting this critical conversation on health equity and racism. And I would like to thank the speakers and panelists for providing participants with insights and reflections that can be translated into actionable strategies that promote health equity and racial justice through authentic, 
nursing leadership. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation stands in solidarity with those speaking out against the COVID-19's disproportionate effect on Black, Latino, and Indigenous people and anti-Black racial violence, and for those seeking racial justice. We echo the voices of outrage and the demands for systemic change, including within the nursing profession. For too long, the nursing profession has identified as being a caring profession and maintained an identity of white color blindness. As a result, we have not addressed systemic barriers that keep the nursing profession overwhelmingly white and female. For years, nurses who come from marginalized groups have raised alarms, supported by a large body of research and literature about the everyday damaging presence of racism and microaggressions in health services and in higher education. These include a failure to recruit and retain underrepresented faculty at many schools of nursing, a failure of health systems and schools of nursing, to develop strong relationships at historically black colleges and universities where the majority of black nurses are educated and readings and class materials based on whiteness. Too often we fill our nursing history with stories about Florence Nightingale and Lillian Wald, yes, our heroes, and leave out other important stories though, such as the black angels, the 300 nurses who worked at Seaview Hospital from 1928 to 1960, caring for tuberculosis patients, quarantined there after white nurses refused to provide care. We have also not adequately addressed the landmark 2003 National Academy of Medicine report that found overwhelming evidence that Blacks and other marginalized groups encounter bias and discrimination in healthcare settings and often receive subpar care compared with white people. That report identified implicit bias defined as unconscious racial stereotypes that grow from our personal and cultural experiences among health providers as the culprit. As a profession, we need to dismantle structural racism within our education and practice settings. We can't center whiteness as the norm. We need a curriculum that specifically addresses implicit bias and the historical roots of racism in the healthcare system. We need true racial and gender diversity. We need to hire, promote, and retain more nurses from Black, Latino, and Indigenous backgrounds, and all nurses need to provide culturally competent care. As a country, we need to address the systemic inequities in healthcare, housing, education, the environment, and criminal justice that result in Black people living sicker and shorter lives. Nurses must play a major role in addressing the social and economic factors that affect health and advocate for change that must be our compass during this decade. Our mission is clear. We must come together to dismantle the racism that keeps black people from living shorter and sicker lives. We will never achieve health equity without dismantling racism. I wanna close my remarks by quoting from an editorial by Calvin Morley and colleagues that ran in the Journal of Advanced Nursing this summer. In quotes, being a nurse in 2020 must mean being aware of social injustices and the systemic racism that exists in much of nursing and having a personal and professional responsibility to challenge and to help end them. It means having an open and caring approach to those we serve. It means being emotionally intelligent and critically reflective to understand how our own attitudes and prejudices might have an impact on who we can and consequently being prepared to change. This will be a lifelong journey in anti-racism where we might all stumble or fall at some point, but being a nurse must mean that we must keep challenging and questioning ourselves and the systems and structures that govern people's lives. I thank you. I look forward to listening and learning from this much needed discussion. Thank you.
now we will hear from leaders in diversity, equity, and inclusion as they provide insights into how nurses as individuals can take actions to build a better future and support the public through our collective efforts. Join facilitator Monica McLemore, Associate Professor at the University of California San Francisco's Family Healthcare Nursing Department, Affiliated Scientist with Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, and member of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health. And speakers, Barbara Hatcher, Principal CEO at Hatcher Dubois Odrick Public Health Consulting Group, and Sheldon Fields, Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion and Research Professor at the Pennsylvania State University College of Nursing. Hello, I'm Dr. Monica Rose McLemore, an Associate Professor in the Family Healthcare Nursing Department a clinician scientist at Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, and a member of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health, all at the University of California, San Francisco. I'd like to welcome you to this Institute for Nursing Leadership. Racism has been declared a public health crisis from the increased rates of COVID-19 infections and deaths amongst Black and Latino populations to the perpetually high rates of violence and police brutality Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities face, it is clear that there are prevalent, persistent flaws in our nation's structures that negatively impact the social and clinical determinants of health and health outcomes. COVID-19 has laid bare for all to see so many of the flaws that need a do-over, a reimagining, and a reconceptualization. And ironically, I say this to all of you, in the midst of a pandemic, that ironically hit us during the World Health Organization's designation of 2020 being the year of the nurse and the midwife. These are odd times indeed. Luckily, we have a roadmap to address these issues. It's all about building power, reallocating resources, and having authentic conversations. I trust you will deeply engage in the, this hard and yet important work. If the last six months have taught you nothing, is that this was all built and it doesn't have to be this way. We are at a watershed moment where we can make radically different decisions than we have in the past. And I ask you to shed your fear and join us in imagining a different post-pandemic, less racist future where we invest in black, indigenous, people of color and the citizens of the world. I am convinced that our panel today has many answers and that this could all be different in ways in many ways, if we only choose to act and to listen. In this critical conversation, scholars who are also leaders in anti-racism praxis, diversity, equity, and inclusion will discuss the systematic racism that exists within education, research, practice, and policy in nursing, and how it prevents us from achieving true health equity. These leaders will provide insights into how nurses as individuals and how nursing as a profession can take action to build a better future and to support the public through our collective efforts. It is in this context I am pleased to introduce our colleagues who will bring uh, pro each provide brief remarks, after which I will facilitate a group dialogue, which we hope can really spark ideas and innovations. First, let me introduce Dr. Sheldon Fields, who is the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion and a research professor at the Pennsylvania State University College of Nursing. And we will begin with comments from Dr. Barbara Hatcher of the Hatcher Dubois Odrick Public Health Consulting Group. Welcome to you both. And let's begin with Dr. Hatcher. Good. Good afternoon or good day. Um, this is certainly a great opportunity for me to share a few points. I would like to start out though with a quote that goes back to 1899. And that quote is by W.E.B. Du Bois. He states that the most difficult social problem in the matter of the Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation toward the well-being of the race. 
there have been few cases in history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. This was stated in 1899. In Du Bois's um, 1899 book called The Philadelphia Negro, he details and characterizes the Negro problem in America. His analysis indicated that the higher level of poor health for Blacks was one, uh, was one important indicator of racial inequality in the United States. While in, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, the dominant medical paradigm attributed any observed racial difference in health to the innate biological differences between racial groups. In contrast, Du Bois saw racial differences in health as reflecting differences in social advancements and the vastly different conditions under which blacks and whites lived. He argued that although the causes of racial differences in health were multifactorial, they were nonetheless, nonetheless, primarily social. His list of um, contributing factors included neglect of infants, bad dwellings, poor food, and unsanitary living conditions. So as we see, it took us almost 90 years to come to that same understanding and to begin to talk about the impact of racism on health and to, to begin to study it with some um, intensity. Now, most the most important comment I would like to share is structural racism. We often talk about uh, individual and personal racism, but the factor, the, the structural racis racism is the component that is most enduring and even if we did away with personal and individual racism, structural racism would remain in place. So one um, example that is important to me is right here in the District of Columbia, where I live. In the nation's capital, three of our five wards have limited access to primary and preventive services and no hospitals. Further, because there are no hospitals, there are no delivery services available to mothers and these wards and very limited obstetrical services. Some facilities have closed. A lot of obstetricians have retired. So women in the most marginalized wards and disadvantaged wards of this city, and particularly Ward 7 and 8 that are east of the river, have to take public transportation 
to get to services in Northwest DC, where there are five hospitals. And we hear stories now of women um, delivering in emergency rooms in the Uber trying to get to a hospital across town and everywhere it seems, but in the hospital. Now there's many reasons for this to have occurred, but what it points out is that they are still in 2020 gr gross inequities in health and mothers and babies and mothers and children are our most important asset to the future. And so I think it is time for we as nurses to re-examine some of our institutional and public policies with an equity lens. Equity acknowledges that there is not always a level playing field. Fair opportunity is not always the same for everyone. And there has over the, the course of society been unevenness in advantage, opportunity, privilege, and power. We also need to advocate for increased funding for social needs and to integrate or better integrate at least um, social services into our healthcare settings, whether it is primary care or tertiary care, we need to take action to create an equity in our, our services and to make sure that social needs are available to those who might need them. We also need to re-examine, I believe, um, more culturally competent services. And I believe nursing is in the position to advance public-private partnerships that would ensure better services. I think nursing can be and must be on the forefront of working with communities to make sure we have the, the needed services for every community. And while some of my comments started talking about the Negro or the Black population, we know some of these, some of my statements are equally true for our Latinx population and our Native Americans. We also need a better focus on public health and community health. And I think we need public health qualified professionals who understand social, structural, and political basis of disease and can work effectively to eliminate the existing negative impact of racism on health. Finally, it, we need more nursing and collaborative research that addresses the hypothesis that racism influences health inequities. Now, what about the American Academy as an organization? I did review the Academy's 
diversity and inclusion statement. And notice that while it describes very well diversity and inclusion, it only mentions equity. But many researchers and experts suggest that equity must be front and center. And as such, we must elevate equity. Diversity is the invitation to the party, as some would say. And inclusion invites one to dance at that party. But equity, the commitment to provide people with fair opportunities to attain their full potential makes it sustainable. People are often um, concerned when they hear the statement, Black Lives Matter. But what Black Lives Matter really means is that we must have equitable and fair services available to everyone. So it is a statement of the need for equity as well as diversity and inclusion. Finally, racism and the absence of equitable approaches is a public health crisis. Much of the inequity is driven by long established structures, unconscious assumptions, and experiences tied to our social identity. We need to reimagine healthcare through public policy, practices, and education. We as nurses must be part of the solution. We must continue conversations like we're having today. We must determine if unintentional bias exists in our networks. We must boost coaching, mentoring, and sponsoring we must continue to lead inclusively. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Hatcher, for your important comments and for really grounding us in public health. I have to say, I really appreciate your, your comments about Dubois. And quite frankly, as a public health trained nurse, you know, I was intentional in wearing my achieving racial equity shirt, uh, which is from the American Public Health Association, because you, like me, both know that uh, Dr. Kamara Jones and many of the great shoulders that we stand on uh, have really pulled together important tools in public health to really help us to understand how to achieve health equity. And so I'm, I'm deeply appreciative to you uh, for your incredible comments, as well as for also highlighting the area of interest of my research, which is black maternal health and how we think about birthing people in the United States. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Fields or reintroduce Dr. Fields and pass the mic to him, I also want to be very mindful to point out that I missed uh, providing my pronouns. I use she and her. I also answer to they. I would love for you both when, when it comes time for us to have our discussion uh, to help me to understand how to respectfully and appropriately refer to you both. So unless you have a, a different opinion, I will refer to you uh, by your well-earned titles of Dr. Fields and Dr. Hatcher. So with that, we will now hear from the Associate Dean for Equity, Inclusion, and a Research Professor at the Pennsylvania State University College of Nursing, Dr. Sheldon D. Fields. Dr. Fields. Yes, thank you. To be Negro in this country 
And to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all of the time. Those words spoken by James Baldwin, who was born in 1924, ring very true today in our current changing and challenged society as we reckon with our racist past, with a call for social justice and health equity. Good afternoon, my colleagues. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to have the ability to talk with you all about not only health equity, but how racism and our roles within the nursing profession work to foster the current social milieu, but as we stand at a precipice and a historical moment, what are those things that we as nursing professionals can do? I often hear from colleagues during this time who are well-meaning and well-intentioned who are really concerned. And the question I often get is, but what can I do? And I say to you all as nursing leaders, I think there is quite a few and quite a bit that we all can do. First, I really think that as leaders, we need to acknowledge that nursing as a profession is not diverse. And as such, nursing has been derelict in its promise to provide comprehensive, culturally appropriate care to all in our society. The profession remains majority female and overwhelmingly white. And this, without a doubt, has led to some of the issues that we're having promoting health equity especially from a nursing perspective. So what do we do? For those in academia, there is much that can be done, but academia has a history of moving very slow. And academia must be more progressive, more purposeful in making substantive changes to curriculum, for instance. Let's start with the basics. Let's start with nursing history. And let's talk about what is often omitted from nursing history. We hear a lot about the year of the nurse and the nursing icons such as Florence Nightingale, but we don't hear about much of the people of color in nursing that have also helped to shape the profession the Mary Seacoles of the world, or the Mary Eliza Mahoney's. We teach our students about the majority nursing organizations, but we do not teach them about the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nursing Associations. We do not teach them about the National Black Nurses Association and its founder, Dr. Lorraine Sands. We do not teach them about the National Association of Hispanic Nurses and its founder, Dr. Adara Morello Rondi. We do not talk about the Philippine Nurses Association of America or the Asian American Pacific Islander nurses or the American Indian and Alaskan Native Nursing Association, all of which have equal importance, especially when we talk about grounding what we do in inclusive voices, especially at this time where people are looking for ways to have their voices heard and finding that the majority uh, nursing organization may not be that voice for them. We celebrate the history of Sigma but we don't talk about Chi Eta Phi, 
the International Black Nursing Sorority founded in 1932 that has provided service to communities around the world. We omit the current sort of modern day history. Very few people know about people such as Dr. Randolph Rash, an incoming uh, fellow this year, who is the first African-American male to get a PhD in nursing and one of my personal heroes. We must expand the notion of who can be a nurse in this country and include a more diverse population. Within academia, we must look at our policies around how do we admit, support, and graduate the widest and most diverse population of students because the current pipeline does not do that. Our admissions policies must be more holistic. And we have to see people as more than just numbers and GPAs, science GPAs um, and pretest scores, because people are more than that. Within the in academia, we really must look at the ways in which we recruit retain and promote diverse faculty. People cannot become that which they do not see. And most schools of nursing, let's be honest, do not have diverse faculties. For those working in the administrative and policy space, what can we do? You need to believe that from a policy standpoint, you as an individual have the ability to make those substantive changes. When you are sitting at whatever power table or influence table or decision table that as nursing leaders, you have the privilege to do, and you look around that table and you notice that everyone looks just like you, be brave, be bold to talk about the fact that the table is not diverse. Then move to action. Move to include diverse colleagues at those policy, administrative and decision-making tables in a more purposeful way. When it comes to clinical practice, what can we do? We need to be mindful that clinical practice, which is vitally important to that which we do as nurses, has also been an area where we have done a great deal of unintentional, unbiased and unconscious harm to our patients. So we need to incorporate trauma-informed care systems and acknowledge the historical atrocities that a lot of the populations, particularly pa uh, populations of color, show up with in our clinical settings. We need to integrate evidence and anti-racism outcome measures in our clinical practices. We need to talk about our organization's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and look at those practice spaces. Do that environmental check. Is your clinical practice, your organization truly welcoming of all, or does it reflect a majority white Eurocentric perspective? When it comes to the area of research, what can we do? And what can we do as nursing leaders? Again, for those who are primarily involved in research, we need to start supporting anti-racism nursing research and anti-nursing racism scholars to really infuse what we do as nursing scholars 
with an anti-racism lens. So new NINR director, we need funding opportunities for this research and research that looks at models of how do we dismantle these racist and struct structurally racist paradigms within the nursing profession. In our doctoral programs, we need to get beyond just nursing theory and incorporate things like critical race theory that will push the mark in how our students and the future nursing scholars view the world. We really need to look at the type of research that we publish and have considerations for research that asks critical and often uncomfortable questions about nurses' role in maintaining the status quo. If we can commit to doing even one of these things where we sit in our leadership positions in academia, administration and policy, practice and research, we will begin to really and truly become the most trusted profession that we profess to be. Thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much, Dr. Fields, for the insightful comments that you've made. I really want to bring Dr. Hatcher back into this discussion because you've really laid out for us in education, policy, clinical practice, and research, you know, some interesting and provocative things that, that we should be thinking about. It would be remiss for us not to name, you know, George Floyd and not to name Breonna Taylor, who has really sparked many of these discussions. So as we open this up into a broader conversation, um, I really would like for us to think about what, you know, the Academy, the American Academy of Nursing, right? The pinnacle of, you know, policy work in nursing. I was lucky enough to be inducted, you know, as a member in the 2019 class. Collectively, as we think about some of the ideas you've put forward, uh, let's start with Dr. Hatcher. I would love for you to talk about a couple of different things, um, particularly since we're both public health trained. What's the role of professional organizations here? How can we be supporting some of the things that Dr. Fields has put forward? In my view, we need some simulation spaces to really help people practice. One of the things that frustrates me greatly is this idea that, that everyone wants to know what to do, but we don't see any real places for people to start to have those broader conversations. Dr. Hatcher, do you have thoughts about the role of professional organizations in helping well, nursing as a profession? Um, I certainly do. And particularly with the academy, I think we need to have a more forceful presence working with the American Public Health Association and other associations to make sure we are pushing the idea of health equity and working with other groups that are also involved in that kind of work. I would like to see a nurse on CNN or MSNBC talking about the problems and the solutions to those that relate to health equity. How can we push it? With COVID, we have a, 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 you know, the opportunity to do that. We know that marginalized communities, Black communities, the Latinx communities, and Native American communities are impacted by COVID negatively impacted. And they have a disparate number of deaths 
and morbidity related to it. But we need to bring to the fore why this is going on. We know it's because many of those people have jobs that are essential and they can't work at home like maybe we have the opportunity to do. We know people have a lot of co comorbidities. That means we need to protect them more, that there needs to be great more access to tracing and, and preventing as many people as possible from getting the COVID virus. So I think the Academy and the American Public Health Association working together to make these kinds of choices and solutions to this current problem is key. Thank you so much. I totally agree with you. And, you know, you brought up a couple of different topics I would love for Dr. Hatcher to build on. You brought up our role in the media. You brought up the role of essential workers. I would argue that nursing started contact tracing, by the way, if we know our history. Um, you also we, should be, we should be on top of it. <laughs> Exactly. You've also talked a little bit about accountability. Dr. Hatcher, you want to, you know, lead and, and build upon what, what Dr. Dr. Fields said? Or, or, or I'm sorry, Dr. Fields, do you want to build on what Dr. Hatcher said or do you want to take us in a different direction? My apologies for well, mixing up your name. No, it, 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 it's quite all right. You asked your, your question was about what could um, the Academy be doing? One of the things that the academy, as the think tank of the profession, you know, the, the greatest minds in our profession are those that are in the academy. But even uh, our current president, uh, Eileen Sullivan Marks, in one of her fan mail uh, newsletters to the academy, acknowledge the fact that the Academy's membership is 84% white. So that tells me that the Academy needs to first look at itself as leaders and realize, back to my comment about that table, that they do not yet possess all of the voices and tools that they themselves need to talk about how do we truly diversify and bring health equity into all that we do. Because COVID-19 did not create health disparities. What it really did was shown the light of the depth and breadth of the disparities that were already there. And as the largest and the most trusted of all healthcare professions, nursing has not always spoken or used its collective voice and its power. As a major policy organization, we have the ability to put forth an agenda calling on all of our other healthcare professional colleagues to raise their game in what we do to work towards this whole issue of health equity. It's not gonna happen by itself. We need to start making some real substantive changes. And as nursing leaders, if we are not having conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion that are uncomfortable, then I think we're having the wrong conversations. completely agree with you. And not only do I completely agree with you, I also think that if we are not speaking with our colleagues from historically black colleges and universities, we're not very serious about our pipeline issues. And so, you know, getting back to something that you talked about, Dr. Field, you know, this idea of pipeline, 
Um, do either of you or do both of you have ideas to think about that you want to share with this audience that are specific to the future healthcare workforce and the, and the faculty and staff that will be required to support them? Because I agree with you. I am concerned uh, that we have had a, a huge focus on students and learners and not a huge focus on the workforce of more senior nurses or more uh, you know, mid-career and later career nurses to help them support their path. So do either of you have reflections on, on what we can be doing around the workforce specifically in, in whatever domain you see fit, education or policy mm -hmm. or research or practice? Dr. Fields, you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. You know, we have to be really honest with ourselves again that we we do not have a workforce that reflects our diverse society and oftentimes when when people hear that we need to admit more uh students of color uh, to nursing programs they hear it as well then we're going to stop admitting or not admit other people and i don't think that's the case i think we need to fight for, on a policy standpoint to make our legislators understand that we need to increase the slots available for everyone in nursing programs at all levels so that we really can increase the number of diverse and historically underrepresented people within our nursing programs. And then we need to be really clear in our nursing schools to provide not only faculty but structure a commitment to having someone such as myself who is a specialist who who can lead that charge for diversity equity and inclusion at your institution you know my role at my current institution is inaugural which means it never existed but it does now and i would encourage those of you in leadership positions to invest in positions such as mine so that we have someone at the table to really champion these issues at your institution because otherwise i don't see how it's truly going to uh, move the needle thank you um I think there's several things that are important to uh, to consider. Um, and I will go back to a point that Dr. Fields made. I love nursing theories, but I think we need to broaden our perspective and look at um, theories in, that are more um, macro level theories to help us as nurses understand how we are part of the whole entire system. As the social determinants have taught us, it's medical care is not going to um, solve all the problems. Nursing care is not. It is our interaction and our ability to resolve issues related to housing or food insecurity uh, or transportation, as my example show. How do you get to access to services? So, and I will go back to the point I made about being more population focused. I believe that nursing's future lies in leading, leading a population focused healthcare system that helps communities grow and develop as they need to. Thank you so much, Dr. Field. And thank you so much, Dr. Hatcher, for your wise contributions, your uh, concrete uh, steps 
for not only the academy, but for individual nurses and for us collectively. We will end our discussion with an invitation to you all to join us. Please, we have, we are, have enough time for questions, for answers, suggestions and comments to move us forward towards lasting and meaningful change. We hope you will join us and we welcome your participation. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for participating in the American Academy of Nursing's uh, uh, Institute for Nursing Leadership. Uh, we're glad to be here live uh, and thank you for watching the recorded comments. Since we recorded those comments, I do want to say the name of additional Black Americans who have died because of structural racism. Walter Wallace in Philadelphia, Dr. Shanice uh, Wallace, the uh, pediatric resident at Indiana University School of Medicine, died in childbirth, a Black pediatric resident. We can do better than this. I'm so grateful that Dr. Hatcher and Dr. Fields have returned for some questions and answers. Um, and I'm going to start with Dr. Hatcher. Dr. Hatcher, we have some questions that have come in. We summarize them uh, from the very active chat, which we all appreciate. And thank you also for completing our poll. Dr. Hatcher, how do we increase the numbers of diverse public health nurses and increase inclusive community engagement? Well, thank you for the um, question. I think we have to raise the, the value of public health nursing. Most, most nurses now want to work in a hospital environment and in the emergency room or other places that are highly interactive. But there's also value in public health nursing. Um, in terms of the diversity of nurses, we have to increase the diversity, the number of nurses that are in schools of nursing. So that is where it begins. And I think the love for public health and for working with populations has to begin there. In terms of working with communities, I think we need to involve communities in any kind of project or efforts that we have. We know we have community boards, we need more of them. And we need nurses whenever we start a project to really think about getting input from those that we want to serve and having them serve as advisors of the um, projects and efforts that we take on in their behalf. Thank you so much, Dr. Hester, uh, Hatcher. Thank Dr. Fields, we're gonna let you take us home and, and really end you know, our session. You know, what are the takeaway points? You gave us a lot of information and you, you provided a lot of uh, support for us to really understand what nursing needs to do. What, what's the take home message? What, what do you want our, our colleagues to hear? So thank you again for, for the question. But that is the take home point. You know, we in nursing have been talking and pontificating about the problems and the issues for long enough. It is time to move to action. And if you are not process of developing action plans for the tables in which you sit as nurses and nursing leaders, then you're not helping the cause at this point. You know, enough of talking about, you know, what the lack of diversity in the nursing profession looks like. If you're sitting at an admissions table and you're not admitting more uh, Black and other people of color to your nursing program, and if you're not searching for resources to support them through those, through those uh, nursing programs. If you're sitting at your practice and you don't realize that you don't have a welcoming environment where people of color come in and can see a reflection of themselves, then you're not doing enough. Um, in terms of research, 
if you constantly only include all samples, majority white samples in your research, and you're not partnering with diverse researchers to expand your research base and your reach, then you're not doing enough. So, you know, enough is enough. Let's move to action um, and really start to move this needle because the complacency of the nursing profession is one that I know uh, um, really concerns me. Um, you know, I know my colleagues are well-intentioned, but well-intentions are not going to get us there. Thank you. Thank you both. I really appreciate having your wisdom. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. For the participants of the uh, American Academy of Nursing meeting, thank you for attending. Thank you for uh, participating. Please continue to send us your questions, your ideas, your comments. I see the chat. I know that there's over 560 people attending virtually this meeting. Let's move to action because we really can nerf the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Fields, Hatcher, and McLemore for beginning this important event with such an informative and thought-provoking discussion on solutions to eliminate racism, achieve health equity, and improve the public's health. Your expertise and lessons shared will be a strong basis for the remainder of the day's discussions. To further the conversation, we have two choices for you. You'll want to click on the session that you'd like to join. The first one is the anti-racism in nursing education and the workforce, leading change. Features Dr. Garrett Chan, President and CEO of Health Impact, and Dr. Walena Gould, Founder and CEO of the Diversity in Nurse Anesthesia Mentorship Program, and a valued member of the Academy's DNI Committee. Dr. Angela Amar, Professor and Dean of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Nursing, will be facilitating this discussion as these expert dissect factors present within education and the workforce that perpetuate oppression and racism and how to dismantle them. The second choice is the unseen diversity, how to elevate inclusivity and affect change. It features Dr. Vincent Ramos, professor of nursing, social work and global public health and associate vice provost for mentoring and outreach programs at NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing and Dr. Margaret Moss, Director of the First Nations House of Learning and Associate Professor at the University of British Columbia School of Nursing. Dr. Hussein Tahan, Vice President of Nursing Professional Development and Workforce Planning at MedStar Health and dedicated co-chair of the INL Planning Committee will facilitate this vital discussion on how to promote and elevate inclusive within the care, education, and workplace settings to achieve real progress toward a more equitable future. Thank you to our speakers and facilitators for leading these incredible, important, in-depth dialogues. There will be an opportunity for members of the audience to interact directly with the speakers through a live question and answer session after the speaker's remarks. On behalf of the INL Planning Committee, I'd like to invite you now to join one of these enlightening dialogues Please note, all of these sessions will be archived and available for future viewing. <laughs>